So since the model that we created in uh, Unit 4 was, in fact, a network-based model, I'm not going to spend a whole long time uh, talking about links and all that kind of stuff. Instead, I want to talk about kind of what kinds of network environments you can easily see within NetLogo and what kinds of environments exist out there. And by the way, there's an entire example of models in the NetLogo models library called networks, right? Uh, and so I highly encourage you, if you're interested in this topic, to take a look at that, right? Um, and so it, there are a bunch of different types of networks that exist out there, right? You can have grid environments, which are essentially our regular networks, right? So if you think about it, right, those kind of square lattices are a regular network, if you will, where each of the connections are exactly the same, right? You could then have a scale-free network, right? So this is a network, uh, it's often called a preferential attachment network, where the connections between individuals are dependent upon how many connections they already have. You can have a random network, sometimes referred to as an erdos reni random network, right? Which is a network in which the connections, the probability of a link existing between any two individuals is controlled by some pre-specified probability, right? Um, and so it's a very random uh, set of connections. You can have a small world network, which is nice because it's kind of between a grid network or a regular network and a random network, uh, and has been shown to have some very interesting properties. And in fact, many real world networks have been shown to have properties of small world networks. And then and that little, you can also pull in real world data and use that to represent your network structure within the model, right? Um, so, you know, just to visualize what these networks look like at times, this is from the, the watson Strogatz 1997 paper. Um, this is a regular network, right? And it might not look like a, a lattice or something like that, but in fact it is, right? Because each node in that has exactly two neighbors in it, right? And so it can be on either side, right? So they have four neighbors overall. And so in some ways this is reflective of, or very similar to some of the square lattices we saw before, right? But it's slightly different because it's in a ring, it's a ring lattice, right? Um, and so in this case, we have a regular network. And on the other side, we have a random network, right? And what Watson Strogatz did that was interesting was they showed that if you start with a regular network and you randomly rewire some of the nodes, well, if you randomly rewire zero, you have a regular. If you randomly rewire all of them, you have a random network. And in between, you get this kind of what they call a small world network, where most people are connected to their friends on either side of them, but some people have these long connections. And this actually, this small world network, it gets you a lot of the properties that we see in real world social networks. Uh, for instance, the famous six degrees of separation uh, uh, property that you see um, is derived because of this small world network. A couple of people that you know are nearby, but then you know one friend in India or Germany or something like that, and they are able to provide a long distance connection. This is the NetLogo preferential attachment model, right? So this is another topology space you can have. And what Barabas and Albert's kind of insight was, was that the watson strogatz model is great at representing the topology of connections, but it doesn't take into account the fact that some people just have more friends than other people, right? Um, and so what they did was they said, well, what if the probability of you being attached to a certain individual uh, was, equal, was roughly proportional to the number of friends they already had? Uh, and what that does is that generates, again, some interesting properties that we see in real world networks, right? Um, for instance, one of the things that naturally comes out of this is what's called uh, the, the friends paradox. And the friends paradox is the fact that on average, your friends have more friends than you do, right? And that seems kind of confusing, but it's because this is a heavy tail distribution. There are a few individuals who have a lot, a lot of friends. And so because of that, on average, you're not one of those people which means that on average, one of your friends is one of those people. And then as a result, when you average all of their friends, when they have a lot of friends with you and your friends who have a very, who have a smaller number of friends than they do, you're going to get more friends on average, right? Uh, and so um, this uh, is an interesting result of something like the preferential attachment uh, property, which seems to exist. Some people are just very friendly. Uh, and so they have lots of friends. 
And of course, the Net Logo you can also pull in real world data. So this was um, an actual Net Logo model that we built uh, uh, back a while ago now, uh, where we pulled in Twitter data and we actually looked at the relationship between individuals in Twitter, right? Uh, and what's interesting is that this network seems, it has some of the properties of the small world network and some of the properties of the preferential attachment network, uh, but it's not perfectly represented by either of them. Um, so that's kind of an interesting idea there. Uh, so I'm going to stop here. I'm going to show you um, a couple of the models. I'm going to show you the small world model and the preferential attachment model uh, that are built into NetLogo. So here we have the NetLogo small world uh, model. Uh, and in this particular case, by the way, um, the model is actually created not using the NetLogo extension, just, uh, sorry, the network extension. Uh, but there are some cool primitives to create small worlds models using the network extension. Uh, but this one actually takes you through how to actually build the model. And it kind of shows you what the network extension does, right? Um, so we're going to set it up. And when we hit the setup button eventually, originally, all it does is create that ring lattice that we were looking at, right? Where each node is connected to a number of nodes on either side. In this case, um, if I remember correctly, it is uh, two nodes on either side. Let's double check that real quick. So um, we can see there's the wire them procedure, which is what's connecting the nodes. Um, in fact, yes, it makes an edge to two turtles on either side of it, uh, and it uses this command edge. And if you look at make edge, by the way, make edge just uh, creates a link with that node. Right? So now we can hit um, rewire one, and what this does is it breaks one of those edges and rewires that edge to a new node. And we can keep doing this, right? And essentially, we are creating a, a small world network. Um, and in fact, what we can do, and this is a cool place where behavior space works well, right? So we can bring in behavior space, and we can run it. Um, and actually, I'm not even going to run it with the output. I'm just going to run it using the actual what's going on here. And what you see, right? So what I had it do was I had it vary the rewiring probability from zero to one. And what um, the original model really emphasized was that when you do that, there is this space right around between 0.001 and 0.1 roughly in this space right here where the clustering coefficient is still relatively high, but the average path length remains high as well. Whereas as you go further on, right, the, the clustering coefficient decreases substantially. So again, I'm looking at the preferential attachment model now. And in this case, again, we're not using the networks extension. We're just going to build this up using the primitives of networks and links in uh, NetLogo. And what you do, you see, is when I hit setup, I create two nodes and I create a connection between them. And then as I let this run, what it does is it adds nodes in such a way that the probability of it attaching to an existing node is, is, is proportional to the number of edges that node already has. So let me re-set uh, that up again, right? And so now we have two nodes and we add one and it has equal probability of joining either one because each one had one edge. So it joined that node. Now the next one joins and it actually had a higher probability of joining this node because that node now had two edges but it actually chose this, right? It is, it is a random decision, right? And it was uh, basically, it was at, at that point because the two of them have two edges and, w and each of them have one, it was a 50%, 25%, 25% probability, right? So we can let it go again. And now it had a higher probability of hitting the two middle nodes because they had two edges. And in fact, that's what it joined. It joined, if I spread it out a little bit, it joined that one of those middle ones, right? And now we can do it again and again and again and again and again and again. And what this creates is what's sometimes referred to as a hub and spoke structure, right? Where the central nodes have a high probability of being connected to because they already have a high number of nodes and the outer nodes have a lower probability. Um, and uh, what, um, what uh, Barry Bossy and Albert showed is that this network structure is very reflective uh, actually of many of the engineered systems we've seen, but also social systems out there as well. Before we leave the context of networks, I did want to mention one other thing. So 
we're used to thinking about networks in terms of, or we're at least to think about environments in terms of kind of standard things like distances and stuff like that. But in networks, a lot of those numbers no longer make sense, right? The Euclidean distance between two agents doesn't make sense in a network-based environment. Instead, what we want to think about is network measures. And there are different types of measures for networks that are often very interesting to use. So degree distribution has already been mentioned, right? That's the idea that if we look at how likely it is to find an individual with a particular degree, that gives us some indication of the network structure. Uh, and there are two other ones that are a little more complex that are often popularly discussed, and so I wanted to mention them now. One of them is the average clustering coefficient. So a clustering coefficient is how many, on average, how many friends of my friends are my friends, right? Or another way to think about it is out of all the possible triangles that it could exist between me and my friends, how many of those actually exist? And a triangle means you know two people and they know each other, right? So that's a triangle. Um, and what this tells you is that if that number is very high, right, the network is very tightly clustered. If the number is very low, the network is not very tightly clustered. Or if you look at the individual level, then that individual's friends don't know each other, right? Um, Finally, another uh, measure that's often used is average path length. And average path length tells you how closely related any one individual is on average to every other individual. In fact, the, when we talk about six degrees of friendship or six degrees of, of connection, we are essentially talking about the average path length of that network, right? We're talking about how close those individuals are to each other. How many friendship connections is it from any person in the network to any other person? To put this in context, in most real-world networks, they often have surprisingly low average path lengths for a high clustering coefficient. Often when you have a high clustering coefficient, the average path lengths go up because you have these tight clusters and it's hard to get between them. But somehow real-world social networks manage to avoid this. The other thing is that with regards to degree distributions, they tend to be power law scaled. In other words, there are a few individuals who have a lot of friends and a lot of individuals who have very few friends, right? Um, and so these are interesting things to take into account when you're building your agent-based model if you're going to build it in a social network space. I should mention here briefly that there's no reason why networks in, in NetLogo have to be social networks. They could be um, uh, networks of supply chains. They could be uh, networks used to represent connections between uh, things based upon a feature space kind of network representation, right? Uh, and, but, so networks are very powerful and that's why um, actually in the in, in, uh, upcoming work on this uh, textbook we're actually going to be adding in even more network content. So uh, that's it for networks. Um, and tomorrow we're going to start about a couple more environments, and then we're going to get into the third and final component of uh, agent-based models, uh, interactions.